Ah, welcome back. Okay, uh, so today we're going to be talking about art and uh, the media and basically how they fit into the anthropological realm, right? And, and this is kind of a big one because art really does uh, uh, have a huge impact on culture. And then how we uh, disseminate that art, how do we spread that art around, um, can also have a huge impact on, uh, on the world and on culture and how we view ourselves and how we view our neighbors. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's hop into this. So what is art, first of all? Uh, well, art is a lot of things, right? Um, we have a tendency to sort of narrow down to uh, a number of different things. You know, we're usually talking about music or, you know, traditional like print art, uh, paintings, uh, movies, uh, uh, sculpture, design, theater. Um, we also look at like clothing, um, martial arts, games. Right? All of these things have uh, various uh, artistic um, uh, aspects to them. And we look at them in different ways. So, and, and this is not, this is certainly by no means a finite definition of what encompasses art. Because there's other types of things that can be seen as artistic. Um, I have seen... Uh, uh, fly fishermen, right, out on the river, and the way that they cast is simply beautiful, right? And it's, it's skill combined with uh, the ability to do something uh, in, in a really kind of an amazing way. And if you have an appreciation for that, it's kind of cool, right? So, yeah, there's lots of things that can be sort of encompassed into art. Um, media, on the other hand, comes about in, in a lot of different ways. Um, we, we see it as, as a means of transmitting information from the creator to the consumer, right? And how that is done uh, can sometimes define whether it is considered to be like fine art or public art or what we sometimes consider to be primitive art. Um, and we're going to be going through all of these definitions um, and, and what they mean. Um, so what is like fine art? Okay, uh, fine art, depending on which culture we're talking about, and in this case, we're going to be primarily talking about Western culture. Okay, fine art is oftentimes seen as uh, sort of the, the pinnacle of uh, artistry, right? Uh, oftentimes, uh, we're going to see it in um, like art galleries or uh, it, it's, it's events that take place that um, are exclusive, right? Going to a, a fashion show um, and, and you have to pay mega bucks to get in, right? Or uh, going to the orchestra or to a symphony and, and being able to listen to that music, and that music is oftentimes considered to be like the apex of, of artistry, right? Even though comparative to other types of music, it might be equal to, say, popular music, um, but because it's so selective, because it has that high standard within that culture, and especially within Western culture, we see it as something uh, more, right? Um, then we have things like popular art. And popular art is uh, this idea of, of easily consumable art. Um, television, uh, radio, uh, books, comics, um, Stuff that, you know, you can go out to the store, you can, you know, go to Target and you can find some, um, some artsy stuff, maybe some prints, uh, calendars, 
you know, stuff like that. That's, that's public art. That's easily consumable, easy access to uh, going out to uh, a pub. Well, you know, when we used to go out to pubs uh, and there was a band playing, that, that's, that's public art, right? That is easily consumable, easy access to it. Um, and lots of people enjoy it. Right. So this is this is something that is uh, there's usually a lot more of than fine art um, because more people consume it. If we were to look at um, and I, I, I certainly don't know if this is true or not, uh, but just as, as kind of a thought idea here, uh, you know, comparing like Mozart to Metallica. Right. I have a sneaky suspicion, even though Mozart has been around for a long time. Metallica has probably pulled in more listeners than Mozart has. And that's just because of access, right? Mozart, there might be, you know, one classical station uh, in, in a city where you could listen to Mozart. But there might be four or five, you know, rock and roll stations that are going to play Metallica. So you might actually have more consumption of Metallica because it's more readily available than there is of Mozart. Um, so as anthropologists, we have to sort of distinguish uh, the, the relevancy between fine art and, and public art. Um, and then we'll, we'll get to primitive art here in a few minutes um, and kind of discuss what what that also means but we have what we do is we go in and we figure out okay so this is this is what we're seeing as far as sort of the the apex arts versus the common art what is consumed how it is consumed how it is shared how it is created um, and then what sort of relevancy does it have within a given society um, art can be complex or simple it can be symbolic uh, it can be um, shared and coveted. Um, and oftentimes this sort of uh, can help us distinguish what is considered to be fine art versus public art, right? If it is coveted, if it is symbolic, if it is complex, we might see it as more uh, apex uh, fine art. Um, if it is shared uh, or symbolic or simple, we might see it in more... Uh, public realms. Um, how it's created and how it's shared uh, can also determine uh, that. So like mass consumption, music, television, um, you might have uh, a chef and their artistry is creating uh, deliciously created and artfully displayed food, right? That is then consumed. So it's temporary. Right, it has that temporary uh, aspect to it, which can create uh, uh, a uniqueness to that art style. Um, so that that could be seen as fine art uh, as well as as a chef is creating something that is meant to be immediately consumed, and then, you know, I mean, if you're like me, I occasionally might shoot a photo of my meal uh, if I want to, you know, kind of egg someone on like, hey, look at this awesome burrito I'm about to eat. And, uh, and then I send it to my mom. And yeah, anyway, she doesn't get good Mexican food where she lives. So yeah, anyway. So who makes art? Right? In Western culture, we oftentimes consider uh, art to be created by artisans, even though a lot of us do art on a regular basis, um, but we don't always consider it to be art, right? We, we might be just goofing around or it's, you know, uh, something fun to do. But, you know, uh, when we think about art sometimes, it, it can oftentimes be um, outside of the normal realm to be a good artist, right? To, be, uh, to, to create something oftentimes in Western idealism, uh, it has to have some sort of value, right? We have to associate artwork with value. Like what is a monetary value 
uh, on this art. And if you can put a monetary value on something, then you can be considered to be like an artisan. Um, and so Western culture deals with the concept of art in different ways, and oftentimes it is connected to uh, how it is consumed, right? How it is viewed, whether or not uh, it's available for sale, uh, whether it's fine art in an art gallery, uh, if it's in a museum uh, to be viewed and, and have tickets sold for admittance, um, whether it is music that is good enough to be played at your local pub right, or at a stadium somewhere. So a lot of times we see uh, some sort of public art dealt in that way. Um, you know, how is it, what, what's going along with it? And oftentimes it's selling something, you know, uh, either the art or sometimes advertisements. But art itself isn't uh, necessarily just to be consumed like that and have a price tag. Um, a lot of times art is what we keep in the house or what we might create on our own um, and maybe share uh, between family members. There might not be a price tag on it. Uh, and those different ways of looking at art will depend on which culture you're actually working within, right? What culture are you examining and how do they define art? Right? A lot of times in, in American culture and Western culture, we put price tags. Uh, that's not the case for every other culture. Right? Uh, there are different reasons to consume. If we look at uh, religious art, religious art is to be consumed, but there's no price tag that's usually attached to it. Right? It's, it's more about influence. It's more about uh, creating some sort of an understanding with, uh, uh, with God or religion, you know, uh, with different ideas and how we consume that. If, you ever, if you've ever been to like a really cool church that's got these amazing um, uh, panels of glass, uh, stained glass, uh, that are just, you know, so artfully done. Um, or... Uh, you know, sculptures and stuff like that that are depicting saints or whatever, right? Uh, really amazing stuff. Uh, interesting to observe and consume, right, by looking at them, by experiencing it. Uh, but what you're getting out of it is also something that's really important. You're getting that that influence from that religious entity. So art, even though you know it might have uh, uh, a different price in this case, right? You're you're getting something from it. So how art is portrayed uh, can have a huge impact on uh, who is uh, who is out there and who is consuming this information, uh, especially when. Uh, and, and going back to sort of this idea of religion and art, uh, a lot of folks, especially in, in uh, decades and centuries past, the only way that they understood, a lot of people were illiterate, um, the only way that they'd understand what was going on as far as the, uh, the, the, the majesty of, of, you know, this religion that is telling them about what's going on in the universe they would see the artwork, right? They could consume that. And that would help them to kind of get an idea of what uh, the meaning is and how are the stories portrayed uh, in that artwork. You know, what is the story that's going on there? Um, so it's a different way of, of creating that understanding and how there is oftentimes a historical presence within artwork and a historical context that because we live in a society today where, you know, most people are literate uh, and we can do a lot of reading and we can, you know, we have a better understanding about history, um, we oftentimes forget that not everybody had that capability. Not everybody was uh, as educated or had the ability to read. It was not often taught. 
So having that historical context, that presence of understanding what's going on is really important. Um, getting back on topic here, uh, let's see. Aesthetics and logic. So oftentimes we look at what is considered to be aesthetically pleasing and what we might consider to be logical, right? And, uh, and how those relationships work within a community. What is aesthetically pleasing? And that changes from culture to culture. Um, and we see this certainly in, in Western culture depending on, uh, and, and you can oftentimes look to like commercials or billboards as you're driving down uh, the street or the highway, um, you can see what people want you to think is aesthetically pleasing, right? And, you know, we have to take that into, into some context. Advertising is oftentimes trying to get you to buy their product, right? But to buy their product, you know, they, they need to convince you. And if they make you look at something and it's, it looks really cool, then, you know, maybe you'll want to buy it. And if it represents you, you know, if it represents uh, your race or your religion, uh, your gender, then, you know, you're being targeted for specific reasons. And that can have a big influence on that culture, right, of uh, consumption of materials, of, uh, uh, of products, uh, but also who is represented, what is also represented, and not. Okay. That was weird. Uh, so, yeah. So, billboards and stuff like that can, can have a huge impact. Um, a lot of times it can also challenge us to uh, consider what is normal. Uh, art has always been... Uh, in, in many ways, a good way of representing different ideas, right? Uh, either common ideas, common concepts, or sometimes challenging objects, right? Uh, making you think about what is actually going on. And this is why uh, when, we, when we see um, oftentimes uh, uh, events in our lives that are uh, in an uproar, and, and certainly we can consider this... Uh, uh, this pandemic um, as one of those kinds of events, one of the things that you're going to see is you're going to see a lot of different types of artwork that is going to try and represent those periods of time to make us consider to reflect upon these events going on and to challenge ideas uh, about uh, common ideas and, and common um, uh, ideologies. Uh, one of the ways that this is done uh, in a fairly interesting and, and oftentimes successful way, and maybe not so much, it's, it's kind of changing, and, and, and I'll, I'll talk about this for a second. Um, if you've ever read the newspaper, right, and, and newspapers are, of course, sort of dying away, uh, but one of the things that newspapers were oftentimes uh, great about were the comics, right? I, as a kid, I always loved reading the newspaper mostly for the comics. Um, but one of the things that comics and, uh, and, and comic writers would do, or comic artists, uh, is they would do satire. And they would create different ideas about events that are going on. They would challenge uh, certain ideas. Sometimes it was just funny, yes, and that's all it was meant for. And other times, they might pick a topic that is really important and challenging, and they would use this, this medium of the newspaper, of, of, the, of the funnies, of the comics, to, uh, to tell a little tale, you know, to, to make you question some sort of an idea. And we've sort of seen this shift go from, uh, like, the comics... Uh, of the newspaper to sort of what we consider to be like modern day memes, right? And memes, we see that, that people can go in and they'll take uh, a picture. And I, I really don't need to describe to you what a meme is. Um, but it's a new way of creating challenging ideas and then shared 
in, uh, in, in, in the multi, um, multimedia and uh, through, you know, Facebook and Twitter and, uh, and all of those. So we see that um, the idea of, of challenging uh, different ideologies, different ideas or practices uh, hasn't changed much uh, with the exception of how it's shared, right? We, we don't oftentimes read the newspaper anymore, but we do spend an awful amount of time on social media. So we still get that kind of stuff. So we consume it in different ways, uh, but it also changes our access um, and the access to those ideas. We'll be talking about that uh, a little bit more. Um, this is something that I think is really important to understand is that culture determines what we consider to be beautiful. Okay. And this is, this is really important to understand is that, uh, you know, beauty, what we find aesthetically pleasing, um, is, isn't always shared around the world, right? Different, different cultures have these different ideas of, about what is beautiful. However, because we're Western civilization, because we're the United States, and we have this uh, hegemonic power, right? The ability to share ideas uh, all around the world, our, our music, our art, our TV, our movies, our clothing, uh, our food. I don't know if that would be artistic. Uh, but all these other things, right, are how we convey American culture. Along with that can be our ideas about what is beautiful. And that can have a huge impact on other cultures, especially when we're talking about issues like race, uh, issues about gender, and the ideology that goes behind those things. So as we've you know, sent all of this stuff around the world, you know, our movies, and we, we always have like, you know, beautiful people in our movies. And because of underrepresentation, a lot of those faces are white. And people see that. And they all of a sudden become influenced into the idea that having lighter skin might be more attractive. And so there are places around the world where uh, the lighter skin that you have is seen as more attractive. And so people will go to incredible lengths even to uh, lighten their skin or to uh, avoid going into the sun so their skin doesn't become darker because of American movies, right? And American singers and, and the stuff that we have sent out uh, around the world and our concept of what beauty is. Now, of course, you know, we're still, we're, we're seeing changes in that, you know, in, in sort of the American idealism, um, which I think is absolutely fantastic with more representation. But that's not to say that that influence hasn't already had a major impact on other countries. So because of influence, because cultures you know, have uh, uh, impact on other cultures, depending on how strong their, uh, their hegemonic power is. Um, we, have, we have seen these shifts uh, take place in a, in a lot of different uh, areas around the world. So it's interesting to, to consider uh, all of the implications that could mean. Um, so, you know, a quick exercise, you know, I want you to consider, uh, and, and this will be um, uh, part of the, the discussion, what, what do we consider to be aesthetically pleasing? What do we consider to be beautiful? And are they the same thing, right? And sometimes not. Um, and, and, and what sort of creates those ideas of, of, of beauty? Right? And how do those ideas change? So, 
go ahead and think about that, write something up, uh, and then we'll end this video right now, and then we'll come back with the next section. Okay? See you in a few minutes.